Hi, everyone. Welcome to this series on how to become indistractable based on my best selling book, Indistractable, how to control your attention and choose your life. Today, we are going to be talking about internal triggers, the very first of four key strategies to becoming indistractable, mastering our internal triggers. You know, our internal triggers are these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape from. And while we love to blame the external triggers, things like the pings and dings and rings in our environment, the fact of the matter is that most of our distractions begin from within. We have to understand fundamentally what really motivates us. And that the problem is much bigger than just our technology. Fundamentally, the reason we try and uh, look for distraction is because we are trying to escape some sort of discomfort. Because fundamentally, time management is pain management. So for all the lost productivity, lost time that comes from distraction, fundamentally we have to understand that it is our inability to deal with discomfort, our tendency to get bored with things quickly, to feel anxiety, stress, uncertainty, whatever the case might be, these internal triggers are fundamentally the deeper reason that we get distracted. And if we don't learn to manage those emotions, we cannot begin to manage our time. So as opposed to resisting the urge to check your phone or eat that piece of chocolate cake if you're on a diet or smoke that cigarette, what we need to do is to learn how to deal with desire in a healthy way that leads us towards traction rather than distraction. And this fundamentally comes down to reimagining these uncomfortable internal triggers that we have to understand how to view them differently by reimagining not only our trigger, but also the task as well as our temperament. How do we reimagine our internal triggers? Well, we can look for, we can look differently at those internal triggers to understand where they are coming from and what we might do to deal with them in a more healthy way, starting with understanding what is the preceding emotion that we feel when we're about to get distracted. So psychologists tell us that by simply writing down these internal triggers, by knowing, noting what it is that we feel right before we check our phone or look at email or scroll social media or check the news or whatever the case might be, whatever distraction you might be struggling with, if you can write down that internal trigger, that is an amazing first step to start helping you get control and mastery over that discomfort. The next thing you want to do is to explore that sensation, not with contempt, not with beating yourself up and telling yourself that somehow you're deficient or broken if you get distracted, but rather with curiosity by being mindful around why am I experiencing that sensation? Where is it coming from? And delving deeper into the root cause of the problem. What we wanna be very careful of is also these liminal moments. Liminal moments are the times between tasks. So if you've ever gotten up from your desk to go to a meeting and then checked your phone on the way to the meeting or from, from the meeting, and now you're still checking your device, you're still uh, checking email 30, 45 minutes, after you've come back and you wanted to get started on that project and now you're even more delayed than you were before, these are all examples of these liminal moments. We want to be very careful about those liminal moments and make sure we have strategies and tactics in place to deal with them when they rear their ugly heads and we are likely to get distracted. What we also want to do is to reimagine the task that psychologists tell us that the way we look at a difficult task has a profound impact on how we deal with it. And what we can do is reimagine these tasks so that they're not quite so uh, onerous, they're not quite so uh, uh, difficult for us to do by looking at them differently. How can we do that? We can add deliberateness and novelty to each task to make them fun, but not necessarily for the sake of enjoyment. How can something be fun and not be enjoyable? It doesn't necessarily have to be. We don't need to put a spoonful of sugar on things the way Mary Poppins told us to. No, we can actually just look for the intrigue, the variability, the novelty in a task, and that can actually make that task pass by quicker and help us stay focused on what we actually want to do with our time and attention. The next thing that we can do is remember that play does not necessarily have to, has to be pleasurable. It just has to focus our attention. It just has to harness our mind so that we can get through that task. So we can look to the, the psychology 
of slot machines or social media that utilize what's called a variable reward. That variableness, that, that mystery, that intrigue that keeps us engaged. So if you can take an otherwise dreary task and find the variability, find the nuance, find the mystery, that actually can help focus your attention so that you can stay on the thing you actually want to do with your time. The next thing we can do is to reimagine our temperament. You know, so many of us have these self-limiting beliefs that really do backfire and hurt us in our day-to-day -day lives, starting with this idea that many people carry around that willpower is somehow a limited resource, that we run out of willpower like someone would run out of gas in a gas tank, and this gained some credibility in the psychology field for a while until it was discovered that in fact, this research did not bear out, that meta studies found that this idea that we run out of willpower, what we call ego depletion, isn't actually real unless you believe it was real. So if you're the kind of person who believes they run out of willpower the way that someone would run out of gas in a gas tank, it literally becomes true. And that's the case with all kinds of limiting beliefs. People who say to themselves, oh, I have a short attention span, or I have a, an addictive personality, or I'm no good with time management. You know, all of these beliefs really do have a profound impact on our performance. So what we have to do as opposed to labeling ourselves with these self-limiting beliefs, what we can do instead is to practice self-compassion. Psychologists tell us that people who practice self-compassion are much more likely to accomplish their long-term goals. Well, how do we do that? We can talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. That's a seminal practice, a key to, uh, to cultivating self-compassion. So what we wanna remember in, in summary here from this very first episode on becoming indistractable is to understand the deeper reason why we get distracted is the deeper reason why we are motivated to do anything. That fundamentally, the reason we go off track is because time management is pain management. That if we don't know how to cope with discomfort, we won't know how to deal with distraction. We have to deal with these deeper reasons why we go off track by learning tactics to harness these internal triggers so that they propel us forward like rocket fuel towards traction rather than allowing them to take us off track into distraction. By realizing that most distraction overwhelmingly starts from within. It's not just about the pings and dings outside of us, that fundamentally we have to figure out what's going on inside of us to make sure that we can uh, stay on track and not get distracted from the things that are important to us in life. That we can reimagine the internal trigger. We touched just a few techniques that we can use to reimagine the trigger. We can also reimagine the task as well as reimagining our temperament. Now, this is just a very short introduction. There are many more tools and techniques in my book, Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. In the next video, which I hope you'll tune in for, we'll dive into the second pillar of becoming indistractable. We'll talk about how to make time for traction. I hope you'll join me. It was a pleasure being with you. And you can always follow me on my website, nearandfar.com, or on LinkedIn. You can find me at uh, forward slash near a l n i r e y a l. Thanks so much, and see you next time.